My name is Paul Vigna. I'm a journalist. I'm a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. I'm from New Jersey, so I'm a local boy. I've been at the Journal, I've been at Dow Jones for about 17 years now. I've been an editor, a writer, covered the markets. Uh, I host a video show now on air every morning, 10.30. Call money if you're interested in watching it. First got into Bitcoin, started hearing about it uh, early in the spring of 2013, you know, late winter, early spring. Wasn't interested, didn't think it was uh, really, you know, like, like I think a lot of people come to it for your first reaction is, this is a scam, this can't be real, this is not, I, and I actually remember being asked to write about it and just saying flat out, I'm not writing, I'm not writing about this thing, it's stupid. And just kept hearing more about it, kept seeing it come up, the, the word pop up, the name pop up. Finally kind of got to the point where I said, all right, well maybe this is something I should at least write about at least help our readers understand it, started writing about it, and it just snowballed from there. It was the kind of thing where the more I looked, the more I saw there was to see, and the further down the rabbit hole I got. And then by the summer of 2013, I think I was completely hooked on it and realized that this was a thing with a lot of implications, and it was something I wanted to write about. The, the turning point was I went to the Inside Bitcoins conference in July 2013 here in the city, and it was the first time I'd been around a lot of people who were into Bitcoin. I had interviewed one or two other people, uh, the Harvey brothers who have uh, Lamassu, the AT, yeah. And I went to the Bitcoin conference, Inside Bitcoins, and, and it's funny because I've seen a lot of people say almost the exact same thing. They go to these conferences and they see the energy, they see the enthusiasm, and you see these very, very passionate people. And to me, what I realized was that it's not just about this technology or the currency. This is an entire, this is a counterculture. This is a movement. This is an actual movement within, wrapped around a technology, wrapped around a currency. And to me, that was very interesting. That was what really kind of hooked me. And that was July 2013. And at that point, I realized that this was actually a very big, very interesting story. And it was something that I really wanted to write about. I think, well, I think uh, it was it was kind of mixed early on. Certainly, you have, and it's still you have a lot of libertarians, a lot of crypto anarchists. You have a lot of techies. I think there's there's both groups there. I think what's interesting, and what will be interesting, is to see where Bitcoin goes beyond those groups. I mean, it's it's easy for techies to get interested in it. It's easy for libertarians to get interested in it. What will be very interesting is to see if people who are not in either of those camps get interested in it. And I think, you know, I'm certainly somebody who's like that. You know, I was not a techie or a libertarian. I was just a markets guy. And it'll be interesting to see if it just consumers get interested in it. That's where, if you're really going to see Bitcoin become a thing, that's where you're going to see it become a thing. Because those groups are obviously going to gravitate towards it. And it's easy to sell them on it. But if you're going to get beyond those groups, that's where Bitcoin really gets into the mainstream, and that's where it really becomes a, a much more powerful story. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I think, I mean, for Bitcoin, it's interesting because Bitcoin is not a typical financial product. Bitcoin is not a company. Bitcoin is not a bond. Bitcoin is something that its success won't be measured in its stock price or even the, the exchange value of it. Uh, or how many people adopt it. I mean, it doesn't need to have constant growth every quarter like a company does. Yeah, it can live within the, the techie world, within the libertarian world, it can live on the dark web, it can live in all those places and still be considered a, a success. It just depends upon who you are and what you want out of it. If you're, um, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're a crypto anarchist, you want it on the dark web. You don't. Maybe you don't want it in the mainstream. If you're Barry Silbert, who's trying to sell it to investors, you want it in the mainstream. If you're somebody who's running one of these for-profit startups, and there are a lot of them out there now, you need customers. You need people. You need it to go into the mainstream. So the, can it live within the tech world? Can it live within the, the libertarian world? Yeah, sure. Uh, the question is, is what are you coming into it with, and what do you want to get out of it? Success is going to be measured differently for a lot of different people. Yes, I mean, education is going to make a, a big difference in it because it is still at a point where it's actually, if you kind of think of it like an automobile, you know, it's still at the 1890s for the automobile where you had to understand how the car worked in order 
to, to use it. You really did. So education was huge. Now anybody can really get into a car and not understand how the motor works, not understand the transmission, not understand the exhaust, not understand any of the systems within the car and still get in the car and drive it. Bitcoin is not there yet, so education is still a huge, huge deal for anybody who wants to be involved in it. Yeah. Uh, yes, the, the people who are most excited, I think, are the people who, who kind of get to a certain level where they, they, they get it. Uh, it's very hard, I think, to get interested in it if, you, if you're not at that level. And what I've seen, I went through it, uh, Mike, my, my co-writer, went through it. A lot of people we've seen go through the exact same thing, which is you have to go through almost sort of a, it's almost, and we write about this in the book so kind of jokingly, it's almost like the five stages of denial. I mean, you have to you go through stages of understanding within Bitcoin where at first you're very dismissive, then you're a little bit interested, and then you really do kind of have this eureka aha moment. And if you get to that moment, then you start getting very excited, then you start getting very interested. And that's where a lot of people who I've seen, uh, they, you know, they, they tell me these stories of they, they spent nights where they couldn't sleep and they just got one online and just devoured everything they could about Bitcoin and quit their jobs and moved to California and did a startup and did these things. If you don't get to that point, you're probably not, you know, if you don't get to that aha moment, you're not going to get to the other moments. But there is a, there is a definite progression of interest with people. Uh, the book ended up being a lot longer than we thought it would be, than we had planned it out to be. There was just there was a lot to tell. Uh, we tell some of it's historical. We go kind of into the history of finance. We go into the history of Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. Some of it is topical. What's going on right now? We talk about Mt. Gox, obviously Silk Road, obviously. Uh, we talk. Uh, you know, we went out to Silicon Valley, interviewed a lot of people, told those stories. So we kind of tried to get a very philosophical take on it, a very historical take on it, a very topical take on it, and just put the entire thing into context and try to explain. And, and look, we're not, we're not taking a, a stand on whether we think Bitcoin is going to make it or Bitcoin is going to fail, whether it's a con or it's the greatest thing, it's a revolution. What we really wanted to do was just really kind of put everything out there and explain where we think it is going to go from here. I think the, the biggest thing behind it is this whole idea of just taking what has historically been an extremely centralized process, which is money creation and control of the currency, and taking that and spreading that out and putting that, that power into the hands of the people who are using it. To me, that is probably the biggest promise of it, and, and that is the thing, again, to me, that would determine whether or not this succeeds, the, the degree to which they can take that power out of the hands of the governments and the banks and, and disperse it and give it to people. I'm considered a weirdo for a lot of reasons beyond just my interest in Bitcoin. But it's, the newsroom, we have several hundred people in the newsroom, and I think it's very representative of what you would see if you went out onto the street. There are some people who are intensely interested in it, and I'm in that small group. There are some people who are moderately interested in it, and there are some people who really kind of laugh at us and think we're crazy. So it, it really is, it's, it's, very, it's very dispersed, the opinion of, of Bitcoin within the newsroom. We've definitely seen an increase in the traffic. We started doing, we were getting pitched so many stories, we had too many stories, we had more stories than we could write about, and we finally decided we just kind of need one place to, to just, let's just find one place to put it all. So we started doing a daily item called BitBeat, and that's done very well. We started that in February, and it was immediately embraced by people, and it gets a lot of readers, it does well on Twitter, you know, the, the stats look pretty good. So we've definitely seen an upgrade, an upgrade, an increase in the traffic, because, well, the traffic was at zero before, I mean, it's like a lot of things. It, it's still, though, sort of a, a niche thing within the journal, within the readership, but we, we definitely, we hear from people, people are interested in it. Uh, definitely the numbers bear out that it's worth our time to do it, and because of that, our editors let us do it. I think when you look at the regulatory apparatus, to use a very clunky term, you have, again, much like the general population, you have a lot of different opinions. You have some people who really get it and are very interested in it. Some of them are in Congress. 
and you have some people who understand it's a thing and it's something they need to look at but they don't quite get it and you have some people who are violently opposed to it and some of them are in Congress too. And I think much like what you're seeing in the general population, like what you're going to see on Wall Street, like what you are seeing out in Silicon Valley, like what you're seeing in the media, you're seeing an entire process where it is filtering through these groups and people are either coming around to it, thinking it's something, or not coming around to it and, and thinking it's nothing, or thinking it literally, again, you know, especially when you talk about the regulators, they have to be worried about what this means in terms of drug traffic on the, the web, what this means in terms of illicit activity. I mean, they, they have to worry about those things, and they are. But what's interesting is I think you're seeing some of the, the leading players. You're not seeing too many people who are, are coming out anymore and saying, this should be banned, this should not be a thing. You are seeing a lot of people saying either I get this and I'm interested and we're going to help it move along or I don't really get this but I, I understand the, the value of it and we are going to address it. And you're still seeing, it's still very nascent, but you are seeing regulators, the Federal Reserve, the banking system, you are seeing them at the point where they at least understand this is a thing that they have to take seriously. Where it goes from there, of course, is going to be hard to say.